Potawatomi, arts, culture, and entertainment. This is a Peace Production. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very, very pleased to be here with you tonight and welcome and hold everyone viewing us on Facebook. My name is Tom Emmett and I'm with the historic General Dodge House. I've been with the Dodge House for about a year and a half and we are in a period of a renaissance there. So if you haven't visited the Dodge House lately, you need to come back and see us again. And what we should be really applauding for tonight is the privileged position we are in, not only to have amazing history, um, in our community, but to be able to see it and to see it through the lens of George Simons. And we're, we're privileged tonight also because the last time so many of George Simons' paintings and drawings were in one place was in the early 60s. Before that, the early 20s. And before that, as much as I can tell, the 1890s. So we're talking about this is a generational, a once in a generation opportunity to enjoy this kind of art with most of it being together. Uh, and it will inform us about our heritage. And when we learn about our past, we can really live in the present and we're guaranteeing a better future. And so I'm really excited for all of you to see the art for the first time or again um, after we talk a little bit about George Simons. First, let's talk about what folk art is. Um, in contrast to fine art, it's it ca characterized with a bit of a naive style and it doesn't follow the rules of proportion or perspective, which is in part what makes folk art so charming. Detail matters. The human person matters. Um, the, the, emo the emotive experience of the person matters. And so in many ways, I think folk art is among the highest art uh, form of art we have. And George Simons was a folk artist. We can tell a lot about his milieu based on his paintings. And uh, George Simons was probably a genius. No formal education in art, no formal training um, in how to read or write. In fact, later on when I read excerpts from his diary, um, I will read them exactly the way he wrote it out. And every now and then I'll share with you some of his very interesting spelling. Uh, in addition, he could uh, repair locks and guns. He was the cook for General Dodge's survey party, particularly with the Trans-Iowa Railroad and for part of the Transcontinental Railroad surveys. He loved to write poetry, even though, and don't tell him I said this, it's not very good. <laughs> he, he fought in the Civil War. Um, he went to Pikes Peak looking for gold and uh, his time in the mil military took him all around the world, as far south as Panama City. Um, he saw and enjoyed Yosemite National Park before John Muir stepped foot in it. And he also loved theater. We have this very interesting picture of George Simons in the theater. Um, we are debating at the Dodge House uh, whether or not the, the person holding the knife is a man in drag or a, a very robust woman. <laughs> Um, but who knows what's going on in, in that scene. It almost looks like it could be a Greek play. We're going to spend most of our time tonight looking at the images of George Simons. And this is a typical one. This is called a, a, a stop on the way, a stop on the journey uh, with a traveler. You can see the hens in the background, the fence, the bluffs, and uh, beautiful, beautiful images. This is one of my favorite as well. I'm going to tell some of the stories behind the paintings and the drawings. So my goal is by the time you're done with this experience that when you see uh, the paintings and the drawings upstairs, they will speak to you far more. And this is um, General Dodge and his father's and his brother's homestead on the Elkhorn River. Um, General Dodge had a good idea where the Transcontinental Railroad would go since he was surveying for it. And so he bought land near present-day Elkhorn, Nebraska, knowing that that's where the railroad would go. Unfortunately, uh, some of the board of directors with the UP had a different idea and it curved south to Bellevue. But Dodge 
didn't get to stay on his homestead for too long. Um, unfortunately, conflicts, intertribal conflicts between Native American neighbors, as well as conflict between the white settlers and Native Americans led Dodge, Dodge and his brother and father to abandon their, um, their claims in Elkhorn with crops still in the field and, uh, two, and many bushels of harvested corn in the cabins. They literally walked away. And they walked away to a, a young town that had just been laid out a few years before, and that's Omaha. And then, so this is where Dodge and his family lived for a year after they abandoned their Elkhorn um, claims. And they endured one of the worst, worst winters we had in the uh, 19th century and uh, suffered greatly. And they decided to retire to the comparably civilized town of Council Bluffs the next year. Again, folk art, we can see here George Simons. It's a, it's a pretty rugged painting. The perspective is strange, yet it's charming. But George Simons would also show a, a lot of technique and a lot of use of color. So here we have an uh, image of Yosemite. And look at those beautiful colors. They're here the perspective is much deeper. Um, and, and we have the buffalo on the bottom. And I always thought that this was Yosemite Valley proper, but it occurred to me this morning, it's Hetch Hetchy Valley, which as you may know, in 1916 was flooded by San Francisco uh, to, make, to, to, to uh, give San Francisco uh, drinking water. And they, they say it probably killed John Muir because he, he fought to keep it. And just look at the beautiful color and the beautiful perspective. I can almost hear Bob Ross. <laughs> this is um, General Dodge's survey camp um, as they're going and surveying um, the, for the Trans-Iowa uh, Railroad. And this is um, the Raccoon River, or known as the Coon River, and it's, it's one of the tributaries of the Des Moines River. So we're just northwest of Des Moines here. And you can see uh, General Dodge's survey equipment and all of the details of what you might expect for a survey party. And here we have a group of Mormons circled up to protect them as they travel west towards, towards Utah. And so what would you bring with you if you were going to go and, um, one moment, if you were going to go and travel the country and um, try to start a new life across the United States? Well, you would need to take a lot with you, as it turns out. Here's just a few of the things that Brigham Young recommended. This is for a family of five. A good strong wagon, two or three yoke of oxen, ages four to 10 years, two or more milk cows, one or more ground beef cows, three sheep if they can be obtained, a thousand pounds of flour, one good musket or rifle, uh, for each male over the age of 12, a pound of powder, four pellets of lead, a pound of tea, five pounds of coffee, 100 pounds of sugar, a pound of can cayenne pepper, two pounds of black pepper, cloves, nutmeg, a bushel of beans, dried beef and bacon, five pounds of dried peaches, one gallon of alcohol, 20 pounds of soap, four or five fish hooks and lines, and 25 to 100 pounds of farming, not that kind of alcohol though. Um, these, are, these are the Mormons. Um, plus for each company of 100 families, one or more sets of saw or grist iron mills, when would you be ready to leave if you were going across the country? Some of the images that Simons provide us are charming, um, pastoral. This is almost relaxing, and it gives, it gives us a, a sense of, of real beauty of the area. But this is the reality of what Omaha looked like in the 1860s. This is a view from the Council Bluff side. And one of the most delightful paintings that you'll be able to see upstairs is this large um, image of Council Bluffs from about 1855-56. And uh, remarkable, remarkable. Um, not much of it survives 
Not much of Old Council Bluffs survives today. Um, but it gives us a sense of how it changed over time. And, and uh, an image of a drawing that he used to base the painting on. It's a little easier to see. We can see Fairview Cemetery up on the hill. We can see the end of Wide Broadway ending there with the ocean wave, that, that brothel that's, that, that is now occupied by the Methodist church. And this, this, is the, the, this is right on the frontier. In a moment, I'm going to show you um, what Omaha looked like during that same period of time from Simon's perspective. But Council Bluffs grew very quickly. Here we have Council Bluffs in 67. Look at all of the activity we have. Could you imagine turning around your wagon? And just a few years later, in the 1870s, now is coming into play. And meanwhile, in Omaha, we have, a, and this is a painting based on several drawings, called the first mail carrier. And we'll get some close-ups. But in the background, you can see early Omaha, which was laid out in 1854 by the leading citizens of Council Bluffs. Uh, for those of you who are Ireland's or Council Bluffians, if someone from Omaha gives you a hard time, remind them who laid out their streets and sold the first lots. You're welcome. No chip on my shoulder there. Here we have a close-up of a letter being delivered, yeah, a dog, a cabin in the back, teepees on the side, and here an image of early Omaha from just after 1854. Its population was initially around 1,000 people at this time, and that includes um, some of the cabins from around. And here's a, a black and white hand sketch image. So Simons would often sketch his um, paint uh, drawings and then years later do a painting, or vice versa. Um, indeed, uh, N.P. Dodge had Simons copy a number of his images. And uh, uh, here's another close-up of the Missouri River, a steamer. And here is Omaha by 1867. Look how quickly it's grown. There's a, there's a fascinating quote here that I'd like to read from one of the earliest um, uh, historians of Nebraska. He writes, the history of the settlement of Nebraska is the reverse of that of other territories. It was not a gradual filling up. The ranks of civilization did not advance in succession. First the hunter, then the trader, then the farmer, then the merchant, and last the capitalist and spectator. They all poured in together. And so that is typical of, of and explains why we had such rapid growth. I suspect this painting comes from his time in California. It looks like those are redwood trees being harvested. And um, it's, it's a remarkable image. And why I pointed out tonight is this is an example of a cleaned painting. Before it was cleaned a few years ago, we didn't know there were rocks down there. And indeed, we hope before too long to get this painting as well cleaned. And hopefully it will clean. But you can see it needs some work. And if we look carefully, we can see a, a picture frame on the floor a stump, some metal. Again, the details matter. This is called a burial on the prairie. And I'm pretty sure the pioneer, uh, the frontiersman there sitting on the horse, I'm pretty sure that's a self-portrait of George Simons in his older years. But probably one of the most interesting tales uh, that we can share about George Simons is when he got invited on a buffalo hunt. So if, if you, someone invites you on a buffalo hunt, think carefully before you ask. They can be very dangerous. And so I'm going to read some, some quotes from George Simons' diary describing how he um, experienced it. Um, he writes that, I had become acquainted with a few Indians and the old chief Whitehorse and his family 
they invited me to go up with them on a buffalo hunt. The Indians were on their march up the river toward, spelled T-W-O-R-G-E, their new hunting ground, their squaws and ponies trudging up on beneath the heavy load of provisions and camp equipment, where the young and old men carried nothing but their bows and spears and guns and sometimes strolling through the woods in search for game. As usual, the women are doing all the work. We had nearly reached our destination when a sad event happened to me. The brush caught the back of my gun, which caused it to fire. The ball took effect in the shoulder of, of the Indian. He fell to the ground in, a frown, in frowning and welter, which means to, wel to welter is to lie in your, in your own blood. Um, of course, firearm, firearm accidents happened all the time back then, much more common. Uh, we didn't have anyone teaching gun safety courses. In fact, General Dodge shot himself in the leg accidentally with a pistol he'd forgotten about in his coat. Um, and uh, Simons said that his first thoughts, he says, the first thoughts that came to me were, spelled W-E-R, to throw him in the lake to keep the, the sad accident from being discovered for fear that the Indians would murder me. Yet the poor Indian was not dead. Then I thought of loading my gun and shooting him through the head, tie a stone to him and sink him in the water. I was strongly tempted by the devil to commit murder. <laughs> but he decided to go and get help, and immediately a tribal council was called to decide Simon's fate, and he didn't need to speak the Sioux language to know it did not look good. But then luck. He spots a canoe. I looked over the bank and saw a canoe lodged on the shore. I slid down the bank and soon had the canoe floating on the yellow bosom of the M Missouri River. And by the protecting hand of God, I was freed from the enraged Indians. So in just under an hour, Simons had shot a man, faced a tribunal, stolen a canoe, and escaped with his life. The next morning, after a walk of 12 miles, he recounts, I was once more safe with my friends in the vicinity of Council Bluffs and the White Settlement and he would live a long life. Um, he was born in 1834 and would die in 1918 uh, in California, in Long Beach, California. And uh, here's an image we have of, uh, that George Simons drew of uh, N.P. Dodge and Grenville Dodge on a buffalo hunt. One of my favorite images is of July Miles. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a fortunately composed portrait this is of an old man um, in his uh, early 70s at this time. Uh, July Miles was born a slave uh, in 1833 or 34. He wasn't exactly sure. He was born a slave in Alabama and uh, said his master treated him and his family well, but despite that, at the age of 14, he ran off to join the Union um, Army. Uh, ended up being transferred to the Navy. Some of the worst jobs you, you could have would be to work um, sh uh, shoveling coal in um, the Ironsides. And so he, um, he was part of the United States Navy, serving in the Gulf of Mexico, um, dealing with Confederate pirates and blockade runners. So can you imagine uh, a, a man who had probably never gone 50 miles from the vicinity of central Georgia, from central Alabama, was now on a ship in the Gulf of Mexico fighting Confederate pilot pirates. Uh, later on, he would get a job on a steamship going up the Missouri, and uh, his brother got a job with Pullman Cars. And through that, he was um, introduced to General Dodge and became General Dodge's so chauffeur for his private railroad car for a number of years. And he was the last uh, African-American Civil War veteran to die in Nebraska in 1941. Some amazing images. Of course, we recognize this as Chimney Rock. Some of, some of the chimney has fallen down since. And I want to spend some time now looking at his time with, in, during the Civil War. 
So we are very fortunate, uh, thanks to the Council Bluffs Library, to have some transcriptions of his diaries. So George Simons would keep a diary or a journal, write in it for a while, then not write in it for a long time, or write in it years later. And um, thanks to a lead from the Council Bluffs Library a couple weeks ago, we've located this diary uh, in Tennessee. And so we're going to try to get our hot little hands on that. And maybe, we're not sure, but maybe one of the lost George Simons paintings. About six of them are lost, including one that was 10,000 square feet that described the journey from um, Omaha, from Council Bluffs, to Denver City. And so we can imagine that's been cut up. It could be around. So check, check your attics, please. Uh, but George Simons decides to join the, um, the Union Army. And we, we learn that he's, he's quite dramatic. He, he writes of his leaving. While sitting here in a silent nook, my thoughts are wandering to homeward, toward my loved ones, toward, T-W-A-R-D. Now I am writing this word here. There may be a loved one or a companion in some solitary spot thinking of me. Perhaps, perhaps the sound that breaks her quiet retreat is the fretting of a little one, his son, um, playing by her side. And so he was dispatched first to Davenport and then south and ended up um, near Little Rock where he and uh, the other Union soldiers had to drink from mud um, from, that were filled with Confederate blood. Um, and here they are in Little Rock, his sketch of Little Rock, Little Rock then, Little Rock now. It's changed just a little bit, but that is the same vantage point. And I'd mentioned that he, he liked to write poetry. So let me give you a sample of his, his poetry. See what you think. Shelby on Winter River. Hark to the distant cannon roar, throwing thick by the shot and shell on a white river distant shore, sending rebels all to hell. Shelby with its cannon set in the cane breaks thick and tall. There are feet he thought to get, soldiers with, su with supplies and all. But it caused him much surprise to see our gunboats rounding too, causing the rebs to open their eyes, and into the woods they hastily flew. So I'll, I'll let you be the judge. But I don't mean to dismiss him in any way. This is a man writing poetry, writing a diary, that had no formal education. And uh, some of his phonetic spelling actually makes more sense. Now, now this is interesting. Um, as they're in Arkansas, uh, um, they come across uh, a tribe of Cherokees who he says were of the wild Indian race but have now become civilized and are good farmers and own Negro slaves. But they've joined the Union Army. So this is, this is one of the many things we see in the Civil War and one of the, one of the great, what makes history so fascinating is we have Native Americans who've been terribly oppressed by white folk who own slaves but have now decided that they want to they fight for the Union. Now, I, I can't explain all of that, but that's the kind of complexity he was wandering in and that he had on his mind when he was painting. Um, eventually, let's see. Ah, these are the winter quarters that they occupied uh, near Little, Little Rock, so they would build their own quarters. Here are some of the locals. You can see a close-up. Oop, I'm sorry. Here is Lake. Um, here is a uh, Fort Pike on Lake Pontchartrain. You might hold on. No, I'm sorry. So here's some uh, here's some locals in Arkansas, and you can see um, on the right, uh, no stereotypes here. A, a fellow playing, sitting on a barrel of whiskey, playing a violin, with a woman smoking a cob pipe. <laughs> Interesting. I'm sorry. Now here's here's um, Fort Pike in Lake Pontchartrain. So they get all the way down to the New Orleans area, and uh, 
stay at that fort for a while. And you can still visit it today. And so that's what that image is. And then these are the ironworks um, where he would stay. That they, they turned these ironworks into um, uh, a place for the Union soldiers to stay. And a, and a picture from the period of time and then the ironworks, you can see he added an extra level. Um, sometimes folk art isn't about being accurate, but conveying the emotions of the place. Here we have Galveston, Texas. Um, one of the earliest images we have of it before, camp, before photography came. And Galveston, Texas would never look like this again because in 1900 they had a terrible hurricane uh, that destroyed most of it. Uh, after Galveston, he makes it all the way to Pan Panama City, Panama. We don't know why or what he was doing down there. Uh, but here's an image of Panama City. This part of Pan Panama City is no longer inhabited, but you can go and see the ruins of old Panama City. So it's interesting to see his perspective and then what, a, what, what the remnants of those perspectives look like today. Fort Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay on a separate trip. Um, he went through, uh, uh, through over to California. And uh, what a difference, huh? And here's Golden Gate Bay and an image today of, of San Francisco with the, uh, the smoke from the fires. And of course, North Yosemite or Hetch Hetchy Valley. I just want to share, uh, before I, I wrap up and take some questions, a few other th information about George Simons. Here is an, a, a letter that N.P. Dodge wrote to General Dodge. Uh, in 1893, and he, he describes his impression of George Simons. While I have known George Simons all these years as a seedy looking penniless fellow, but sober and of good habits, I did not appreciate his artistic ability until one day he brought to my office a greasy looking lot of sketches, and I at once picked out about 15 of them for him to copy for me. He remembered our farms at Elkhorn, and I sent him out there to sketch them and make them just as they looked in 1854. How well he has succeeded, you can judge. For two weeks, he has been working at these sketches into the book I send you, and which I am sure you will value more than I do. He is equally skillful with the paintbrush and should copy for you on canvas any one of the sketches so you so as to look as natural and be a credible production for an amateur. I examined some of his paintings yesterday. He is, poor, he is as poor as the day you picked him up at Davenport and lives in a two-roomed uh, shackly frame house with one of his daughters on Upper Broadway. He just managed to get by, and that was about it. Um, the three places that have the majority of the Simons collection are Pace, the Council Bluffs Library, and the Dodge House. Um, the Dodge House is blessed enough to have uh, this book of sketches that Nathan Dodge um, had gifted to Grenville. And what I hope to do is eventually have a George Simons room with each of the, a copy of each of those and then a modern day image beside it. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, we have a total of about a dozen paintings in addition, and the public library and Pace have many of the sketches. And then we might have one in Tennessee. Um, uh, the Jocelyn has two in storage, and then uh, the Nebraska Historical Society owns one. And I think the library has the one of Council Bluffs in the 1880s and maybe one other. Um, but we are really lucky to have them all available to us to view upstairs. Let me just make sure I didn't forget anything. I, I've ju jumped around a lot, but our information about Simons is we don't have a complete story. There's, there's holes in that, in that information. I think that is all ha I have. I'd be more than happy uh, to take any questions at this time. He 
he had um, a, a total of six kids, I believe, but only three of them survived to adulthood. And his, his youngest daughter died in 1954. Um, Tom, I was just wondering, I didn't hear you mention, you might have, uh, where he was born. And then did he marry a Catholic girl? Um, so we don't know where he was born. We think Illinois, but maybe Canada. Uh, so that's, which is interesting that, that we don't know that information. More, more likely he was born in this country, but, but um, some people do claim that he was born um, in Canada. Oh, when did he come to Council Bluffs? So um, General Dodge hired him in Davenport. And then he worked with General Dodge as the cook for the survey crew and arrived first in 1853 or 4. 54, I believe. Well, on that, I want to thank everyone for coming out, uh, joining us tonight for the celebration of history and art. Um, and again, um, thank you so much. That was wonderful. My pleasure. Eloquently said and a beautiful presentation. So let's give one more round of applause. And then, uh,